Earth is a global multi-stakeholder initiative launched in 2013 to transform the way GBV is addressed in humanitarian settings. Its partners include um, states and donors, international organizations, NGOs, and local civil society organizations, many of whom you'll be hearing from today. And the call to action's goal is that every humanitarian effort from the earliest stage of a crisis includes the policies, the systems, the mechanisms to prevent, to mitigate, and to respond to GBV. So how well is that working and what can be done to increase the momentum towards that objective? That is what we are here to explore today. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. The event will not have a Q&A segment, but you can use the chat to share your ideas on how to address GBV. English and French translation is available. You'll see at the bottom uh, right of your screen an interpretation button, and you can click there to choose the language you'd like to hear. And if you'd like to only hear the interpreted language, uh, click mute original audio. De l'interprétation entre anglais et français est disponible. Alors, en bas de votre écran, vous verrez... Um... Interpretation in French and English is available. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, you have a, a button where you uh, can click for the language of your choice. Call to action GBV. Now, I run the uh, nonprofit newsroom, The New Humanitarian. Our journalists report uh, around the world on conflicts, disasters, and other humanitarian crises. And the reason I was uh, interested in sharing this event today is that women and girls form a core part of our reporting. We try to provide a platform through which they can tell their stories. And last year at uh, the conference in Oslo on ending sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian crises, uh, which I believe many of you were present at, we uh, made a, a number of pledges to better understand the unique needs of women and girls in humanitarian crises to amplify their voices, not only as victims, but as agents of change, to avoid sensational reporting that robs women and girls of their dignity, and to document sexual abuse and gender-based violence in conflict areas and other crisis zones. But perhaps most importantly, to hold accountable governments, peacekeepers, aid agencies, and anyone else who fails to protect the rights of women. So um, a little uh, warning look out for a major investigation we'll be publishing next week about the sexual abuse and exploitation by aid workers uh, of women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Since that Oslo conference last year, as we all know, uh, the world has been hit by a major pandemic that has actually um, negatively affected GBV around the world. COVID-19 has led to increases in domestic violence, but also increases in GBV in humanitarian settings. And our uh, newly launched series, She Said, offers glimpses into the lives of women and girls from emergencies around the world who, uh, as a result of COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions, have faced increased gender-based violence from uh, South Sudan to Colombia to Jordan to Kashmir. And again, you'll hear some examples of that today. So all this to say the issue could not be timelier. Uh, we've got a packed program for you today, and so we're just going to jump right in. And to set the scene, we will hear brief remarks from four opening speakers. Unfortunately, Minister Gold of Canada was unable to join us today, but we are lucky to have in her place uh, Canada's Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence, Anita Vanderbilt. So Anita, over to you. Yes, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd first like to extend regrets from Minister Gould, who really wanted to be here today. Uh, when she last saw many of you last June at the annual partners meeting, she encouraged you to be bold, be visionary, and to leave nothing out as you look to make new commitments on the call to action roadmap. And just changing language, sorry. C'est encore C'est encore plus important maintenant avec le COVID-19. More important now with the COVID-19 because there's uh, a lot more uh, domestic violence towards girls and women. There's a lot of uh, forced marriages for children and more, the most vulnerable people that are already facing crisis situations are now confronted with this pandemic. When Canada became lead of the call to action, one of our priorities was to shape the strategic direction of the initiative over the next five years. Today, I am proud to publicly launch the 2021 to 2025 call to action roadmap on behalf of Minister Gould and the Government of Canada. 
In partnership with the Women's Refugee Commission and after consulting with all of the partners, the updated roadmap builds on the original objectives. It has used best practices and lessons learned, as well as emerging trends to build an even better and more strategic framework to guide our collective action. Now we are asking all of our partners to reaffirm their commitment to the call to action so that we can keep up and even increase momentum on addressing gender-based violence. As part of Canada's humanitarian COVID-19 response, we have provided support to the Red Cross movement and UN organizations such as UNFPA, UNHCR and UNICEF, which are addressing GBV. We have also provided funding to OCHA's country-based pooled funds so that resources could flow to the efforts of frontline national and international organizations. Canada has met its Oslo commitment and contributed 33 million to our UN, Red Cross and NGO partners for GBV in 2019. We have been pleased to mobilize the call to action to publish four joint statements on behalf of 87 partners on the Oslo Conference, on the Global Refugee Forum, on Beijing plus 25 process and on gender-based violence and COVID-19. During our leadership, 48 partners, partner reports on GBV activities were released publicly for the first time. The new roadmap will require our commitments and reporting on them to be made public. This is simple but important as a step toward holding ourselves accountable. The roadmap sharpens the focus on gender equality, accountability, localization, intersectionality, and the empowerment of women and girls. We expect that all partners will announce their new commitments under the roadmap before the end of next year. Canada's commitments will be in line with our feminist international assistance policy and the Women, Peace and Security agenda. They will focus on localization, funding for action against gender-based violence, and risk mitigation. We recognize the important role that local organizations, especially women's organizations, play in their communities to prevent, mitigate, and respond to gender-based violence. But we also recognize that it is not their job alone and that all humanitarian actors have the responsibility to mitigate GBV risks, whether as part of delivering wash services or providing food assistance. And for those organizations that deliver GBV services as their mandate, we will ensure predictable and flexible funding. Canada's leadership of the call to action will draw to an end in December 2020, but we remain dedicated to working with all partners to meet the goal of the call to action and end gender-based violence by 2025. Thank you very much, merci. Thank you very much, Parliamentary Secretary. And our next opening speaker is Mark Lowcock, the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Head of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. Over to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Heba. Hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to be joining you all today uh, for this important discussion. And thank you, Canada, for leading the important work on the call to action at a time when COVID is of course making the problems we're concerned about here so much worse. The call to action and the new roadmap could hardly be more timely. So thank you to everybody who worked so hard on it. As the Secretary General has said many times, the pandemic is having devastating social and economic consequences for women and girls especially. Um, and as Anita said, we already know that gender-based violence has increased everywhere since the pandemic began. We see a surge in family disputes, in intimate partner violence and in child marriage. We see girls dropping out of school, many of them with little hope of returning, leaving them, of course, then at yet greater risk of gender-based violence and early marriage, and leaving them also with dimmer hopes for their economic future. So what can be done? We continue to try to rally support and prioritize gender-based violence, including in the Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19, and also in UN Women's Gender Program in Humanitarian Action for COVID-19 that I was privileged to help from Zilli launch in July. We've scaled up GBV services like community-based protection and hotline services, which in some places have reported a 700% increase in calls. We try to ensure that sexual and reproductive health services can continue even as health systems in fragile places strain under the weight of COVID-19. 
But the truth that we have to acknowledge is that the rhetoric is way ahead of the reality of our collective action and of the effectiveness of that action. We are not meeting the needs of women and girls in the way we all want. Because of the pandemic, gender equality, women's rights, and even physical safety for many women is more in jeopardy now than in recent years. One of the problems is that the whole humanitarian system currently is overwhelmed, which is perhaps unsurprising in the midst of the worst international crisis for 50 years. We have been advocating for more funding for the mitigation response and prevention of gender-based violence. We continue to explore ways of directing funding towards local women-led organizations. Last year, I directed that the fund I managed, the Central Emergency Response Fund, put an increased focus on four priority areas. And one of those is addressing gender-based violence and reproductive health and empowerment for women and girls. All the UN's humanitarian coordinators now need to demonstrate how they will address these priorities if they want to get funding from the Central Emergency Response Fund. The result is that we are earmarking significantly more money for the things women and girls need and say they value. The SURF though needs to do better and we plan that it will, but the SURF represents less than 5% of all the resources we raise for UN coordinated responses. I think there are three things we need to do across the whole of the humanitarian system if we want to make faster progress in changing things for the better. Firstly, we have to find ways to change programs for women and girls, especially those tackling violence, from being one of the least well-funded parts of response plans to being among the best funded. That is not about presenting yet more projects or different analysis. It's about finding ways to help donors actively to prioritize this issue in their actual decision making on what they're going to fund. Second, we can't prevent gender-based violence without addressing the root causes. And I'm therefore pleased to see the new roadmap addressing gender inequality explicitly. I really think we need to be more direct in saying clearly where the problem starts. It starts with men and boys, with the beliefs and values and behaviors that are inculcated in them and in the systems built up over many centuries whose actual effects are to their advantage and to the disadvantage of women and girls. Third, we need to strengthen accountability. Again, as Anita has said, um, OCHA and UNICEF and others are working on rolling out the GBV accountability framework as part of the new call to action roadmap. I was very pleased last year, together with the government of Norway, to be involved in organizing the successful Oslo conference on ending sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian crises. In a few days from now, the organizing countries and, and organizations, including the United Arab Emirates, Norway, Iraq, Somalia, UNFPA, the International Committee for the Red Cross, and my office are gonna report on the progress made since then. But what we'll see is we've not made enough progress. So the time to act is now. And I'm really looking forward to listening to all of your contributions today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, you can count on us in the media to contribute to that accountability piece. Our next opening speaker is Natalia Kanem, who is the executive director of UNFPA, the UN's sexual and reproductive health agency. Natalia, over to you. Thank you so much, Heba. Excellencies, distinguished guests, partners, friends, whether she lives in a house or in a tent in a refugee camp, every woman has the right to peace in the home. Today's meeting and our call to action to end gender-based violence and humanitarian crises comes at a dramatic world moment. And we too thank Canada for leading on the new roadmap. And I would also like to thank OCHA because their commitment to the call to action and the prioritization of support to women and girls through actions to address gender-based violence is also very important as we join together across sectors to promote reproductive health, to empower women, and to get to zero on gender-based violence. UNFPA's commitment to that and to the effective implementation of the roadmap is unwavering. 
both at the global level and on the ground where it counts. It's especially critical now with reports of gender-based violence indeed skyrocketing because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown situations. The power of this call to action lies in the accountability, accountability to the women and girls most affected. And it reinforces the fact that survivors have a right to assistance, to support, and to justice. And as we launch this new five-year roadmap, we do take stock of the progress that we're making together so far, and we admit that we have quite a ways to go. Under the previous roadmap, UNFPA led the development of the interagency minimum standards for GBV in emergencies programming. They were launched last year. These 16 standards have guided the provision of quality services for survivors. And the standards are advancing women and girls' own leadership, their role as first responders, and community engagement to change the attitudes that Mark just spoke about to end GBV. Now, uh, we welcome this strength and focus and the localization um, aspect of the new roadmap. And I am proud to report that 38% of UNFPA funds in 2019 went to local and national partners, including local women's organizations. So that exceeded the benchmarks that were set for the grand bargain. And as the lead agency for GBV coordination and emergencies, we work closely with all women's organizations because they know the situation. They know the solutions that they want to see. And they're central to these efforts to deliver consistently on our GBV leadership commitment. And in fact, I believe that that is part of the healing. Addressing mental health and providing psychosocial support for that healing, empowerment and recovery are critical. And it is time for women to be allowed to heal. Therefore, listening to women and girls and emphasizing their voices, which for too long have gone unheeded, should inform everything that we do. And I'll say one last thing loud and clear. The investment piece is fundamental, closing that funding gap, because these shortfalls mean that we're falling short. Indeed, this was a core message in Oslo. And as a Rohingya woman told me, it's the wound that you don't see that cuts the deepest. So absolutely, UNFPA will join you to take every measure possible to keep women and girls safe and to fulfill the promises that we have made. So indeed, no woman or girl is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. We have, after a bit of struggle, gotten our uh, last opening speaker to join us. Um, so that's Fani Joyce Vuni, who is a refugee activist and coordinator of UNHCR's Global Youth Advisory Council. She also co-founded the Youth Empowerment and Mentoring Initiative in Kenya, which works with youth to help them understand their rights and mentor other youth in their community. So uh, Fani, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, we're having some technicalities here, but finally I'm here. Um, the renewed call to action roadmap reflects the importance of collaborating with and reinforcing local efforts, especially those led by youth, particularly young women. Um, the surge of GBV incidents um, during this COVID crisis has demonstrated how important the call to action is, but also how essential local actors are, in, are, in, are making it real. In many communities around the world, uh, traditional organizations that normally would provide services and support uh, or protection for refugees at grassroots levels have had to restrict their movement. Um, this has created a void, of course, in the way services delivered in many locations. Young refugees have stepped into that void and taken an active role in responding to the challenges caused by the pandemic within their communities. Because they're living in the community, they see and hear the difficulties that young girls and women face. Farida, a colleague of mine, is an example of this. She's an incredible young woman who's helping her community. She's a survivor of child marriage. She's a young mother and also a, wid a widow. Those experiences shaped her to become an amazing advocate against child marriage and a champion for inclusion of women and gender equality. She chooses to use her experiences to help others in a community and is currently running uh, One Touch Studio in Chaka 2, which is based in uh, Uganda, and using music to really educate the community on GBV. 
the COVID crisis has intensified her work and like many other young women, she is leading the action to prevent and respond to GBV, including identifying protection concerns such as domestic violence or sexual assault and raising aid to attention of the authorities or the other protection actors, intervening with the parents of young girls at risk of child marriage or involved in trans transactional sex, uh, raising funds to purchase food and hygiene kits to distribute to vulnerable members of the community, and using art, and mu using art music, and drama to educate the community on how to end GBV. Many young refugees are devising and running similar activities around the world. Why do they do this? Because they understand the needs of their communities at a very intimate level. This makes them uniquely well-placed to provide assistance, mitigate risks of GB GBV, and address gender inequality. This is why localization is important. Localization is about strengthening these efforts. My call, my call to action to all of you today is to support youth, women, and girl-led efforts by, make, by working as equal partners with them, making funding accessible through mini grants and accelerated mechanisms without a lot of bureaucracy, providing technical assistance and mentoring to strengthen their capacity, their leadership capacities and recognizing and responding to refugee leadership and being accountable to them. A change in mindset and ways of working doesn't happen overnight. I acknowledge that. However, for power to shift to the grassroots level organization, there needs to be intentional letting go by those that have more power. And this requires courage and considerable adjustment and mindset, systems and structures. If we can do this, then we will support them. Let's do this under the call to action to end GBV. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fanny, for uh, those words that have stuck with me. Intentional letting go requires courage. Um, I think we've heard a, a big emphasis already in the four opening speakers on accountability, on getting the funding where it's needed, addressing root causes, and really working with um, the, the heart of the people affected, the communities involved, and letting them lead the way, um, as Fanny has just put it. So thank you for setting the scene for us. We're now going to move to uh, a kind of rapid fire roundtable segment. But before we do, I wanted to, to outline the six kind of key priorities or outcomes from the call to action, which are to first develop policy frameworks and capacity um, to address GBV at the field level. Second, to ensure effective coordination. Third, to collect, share, store, analyze um, data, but safely and ethically on GBV uh, in a way that supports programming and funding decisions. Fourth, to ensure, as we've just heard, uh, sufficient funding goes towards addressing GBV. Fifth, to include specialized GBV programming and finally, to integrate the mitigation of GBV risks into all programming. So th those are, if all went according to plan in the roadmap, the outcomes that you would see. Um, which brings me to this rapid fire round because um, here we're gonna ask partners of the call to action um, a few questions around elements that have been strengthened in this roadmap relative to its previous iteration. Um, and namely, an increased focus on, as uh, we've just heard, localization. Um, gender equality and intersectionality. Uh, the challenge for you is that you have one minute to answer these big picture strategic questions. So I see this as a test of modern diplomacy. If you were with the likes of Donald Trump in a room, I think if you didn't get him within one minute, you'd lose him. So show us your best shot. Contestants, are you ready? The first question will go to Baroness Liz Sugg, UK's Minister for Foreign and Development Affairs and um, the UK Special Envoy for Girls Education. Um, that question will also go to Hilda Mucci, Director of Programs and Resource Mobilization for the Coalition for Humanity, which is a South Sudanese NGO that works to save lives and alleviate suffering. So the question is, there are only about six local civil society organizations who are currently members of the call to action. How can the humanitarian community meaningly, meaningfully fulfill the, the new roadmap with its renewed focus on localization? Baroness Sugg, over to you, you've got one minute. 
Thank you. Well, listen, Fanny just made the case really clearly on the importance of localisation. Women's rights organisation, local GB actors really are the frontline responders and we can't wait until an emergency strikes to partner with women's groups. We need to do a longer term approach that builds their capacity and resilience. The UK is working to support sustainable funding models for women's rights organisations and we really congratulate Canada for their pioneering leadership through the Equality Fund. We're also working with UN agencies and international NGOs to really encourage more equal partnerships with local organisations. We want to see a fairer percentage of core funding reaching women's groups and ensure that they can access the pooled funding streams like the UN country-based pool funds. And it's really critical for this to build capacity and resilience of local actors and really allow women to design and advocate for their own solutions. Thanks. Wow, that is impressive. Under one minute, I hope. <laughs> yes, everyone, every, no, she's the one to beat. Um, Hilda, have your go at that. Bargain commitment suggests that 25% of funding goes to local and national organizations. It's a high time we implement the grant bargain in terms of GBV so that we have a given percentage committed to local organizations and local organizations should not be able to compete with international organizations on the same funding. Then the next issue is that local organiza international organizations should have a model of partnership whereby 25% of, of their GBV funding should be able to go to a local partner and they implement this in partnership. Thank you. I'm genuinely impressed by this group. Um, if we keep this pace, let's see who of the audience can actually remember everything at the end. The next question will go to Danny Glenwright, who is the um, Executive Director of Action Against Hunger Canada. Uh, Danny, this call to action comes in the midst of COVID, as we've just said, uh, in which kind of everyone is, is perhaps focused elsewhere. And there is a risk that some COVID responses could exacerbate uh, GBV risks. For instance, if you give uh, cash vouchers to women instead of men, it is empowering, but it could also lead uh, to some some pushback. Um, on the flip side, if done well, COVID responses could could be perhaps an entry point to better GBV prevention. So how can humanitarians better address GBV um, through the COVID response? One minute, okay. over to you. Thanks, Eva. Here we go. So at Action Against Hunger, we know that GBV is both a cause and a consequence of hunger. As Mark has said, we see young girls and women being pushed into early marriage because there is food insecurity right now. We know that because there's not enough food in the homes, uh, it's really impacting women. So we need to work across multiple humanitarian areas as we do at Action Against Hunger. I'll give you a quick example. I was visiting one, a refugee camp in Ethiopia last year where we work, and we saw this up close. Uh, a generator had broken, which had an impact on water distribution in the camp, which meant that we saw a spike in acute malnutrition, which led to a spike in GBV rates. So we know that if one thing goes wrong in a camp, everything goes wrong. So that's why we need continued collaboration in, in this uh, fight against COVID-19 among all agencies. And we need the governments to follow the lead of Canada, which is to put women's economic empowerment at the heart of everything. We wouldn't accept it if COVID is still plaguing us in 10 years. So we can't accept that GBV, which has been a problem for decades, is still plaguing our work. We can't accept that any longer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Next question will go to uh, Pumzile Lambo Nuka, who is the uh, Executive Director of UN Women. And uh, that is, if gender equality is at the root of GBV, how should humanitarians be addressing what is essentially a development issue? Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ocha, and thank you, Canada, uh, for, your, for, your, for your leadership in this area. Here we go. The first thing uh, to say is that uh, the best way to address uh, any type of violence is to prevent it. I wish we were not having this uh, conversation. Uh, promoting gender inequality has the possibility uh, to be a preventive measure as well as to complement whatever actions are being taken to address uh, violence. But also, we also have to take multi faceted a multifaceted approach which address in a very specific way the social political economic legal factors that drive gender inequality and enable violence uh, to be 
almost institutionalized. In both emergency and the other uh, settings, uh, the promotion of gender equality and women and girls empowerment needs to be factored and budgeted for because uh, this work is not free. It does take a lot of resources. We also need to be focused on mobilizing uh, communities so that we can strengthen their own agency. We need to make sure that the economic, political, and social means that are there in the community uh, are under the control of women so that women can talk about their own lived experience. I think I always find it very difficult when the, the people who dominate in deciding what must do, the men, what, what must happen to men's violence against women are men themselves and women are supposed to actually uh, listen. And of course, the laws, the laws, the laws, because many of us are coming from institutions that are, are standard uh, setters and we make policies and laws. I think my minute is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, but you've just reinforced now the challenge, I think, because so many of what you've talked about there are these deep-rooted development challenges, and suddenly now humanitarians are kind of being thrust into the position of having to uh, shift the needle on them. So I'm going to put that same question to Agida Anani, who's the director of ABAD, a resource center for gender equality in the Middle East and North Africa. How should humanitarians be addressing gender equality as the root cause of GBV? Mm -hmm. Well, GBV is one of the most widespread, persistent, and devastating forms of human rights violation in our world today. And it occurs in every country around the world and affects every home. So none doubt, none doubt the best way to achieve peace everywhere is by simply reducing violence everywhere. And the best way to reduce gender-based violence and eliminating gender inequalities is by involving everyone, and literally everyone and engaging actively and effectively both sides of the equation of equality, women and men, and ensuring leaving no one behind. So when we start treating uh, gender equality as a matter that is concerned everyone, and it's not only about women's rights, I think we can start addressing all these rooted social norms that are affecting attitude practices, policies, legislations, and even economy. Thank you. You've just brought back to uh, what Mark said off the beginning uh, around the need to both uh, change the mentalities of boys and, and men, but also I think that boys and men also face um, threats of their own and that they need to be equally taken into account. Thank you. Next question in our rapid fire uh, contestants round. COVID-19 has exacerbated the risk for adolescent girls in terms of early enforced child marriage. As we've heard, uh, we know that um, People experience GBV differently based on age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity. How do you go about ensuring that the approach you take to GBV programming kind of takes into account all of those intersectionalities? So first up is Yanis Linarcic, the EU's European Commissioner for Crisis Management. Thank you. Well, this is where the intersectional approach comes in. The fact is that uh, women and girls are predominantly affected by GBV, and that is due to the uh, deeply rooted gender inequalities. But there are other factors that we have to look into, the factors that further heighten the risk of GBV, GBV and we also have to look at how to strengthen our response. Uh, this intersectional approach looks into, first, structural gender inequalities, but then it also looks into where and how these uh, inequalities intersect with other structural inequalities because that may further increase the risk of GBV. And these other structural inequalities include, for instance, women and girls with uh, persons with diverse sexual orientations, gender identity, and ethnic and religious minorities. That's why we encourage our partners to strengthen this intersectional approach. Wonderful. And I, I, when you say uh, encourage our partners, I'm reminded of what was said earlier around um, the power that donors have to make funding conditional upon um, certain, con certain criteria being met. So uh, hearing that trend again. I'm going to put that same question to uh, David Miliband, president of the International Rescue Committee. Uh, why is an intersectional approach so central in GBV response and programming? Hi, Heather. Good morning. 
everyone, proud and privileged to be with you all. I think this is the test of whether our rhetoric of helping those most in need is something that we're ready to live up to. From our point of view, the importance of the intersectional approach is that it forces us to address the greatest vulnerabilities, the multiple vulnerabilities and identities in the way that Janusz Lenarczyk has said. We need to remember that before the COVID crisis, we were off track to meet the SDGs in fragile and conflict affected states. And we were especially off track for those most in need. That's why we as an organization say that to be a successful humanitarian organization, you also have to be a feminist organization, which takes seriously structures of inequality and ensures that in the way that we develop our systems, our programs and our policies, we attack those inequalities of power in a systematic way. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks so much, David, and really pushing the boundaries there, I think, on what uh, might be traditionally considered a humanitarian organization, but uh, a direction that I'm hearing uh, more and more these days. The last question in our rapid fire round goes to um, Jagan Chapajing of the International Federation of the Red Cross, uh, incoming Secretary General, um, sorry, Red, Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, of course, and to uh, Rasmus Pran, Denmark's Minister for Development Cooperation. Um, I'm afraid this is a challenge that never seems to go away, no matter what we're talking about, and that is coordination, both um, in this case within the GBV sector, where there isn't, as we've heard now, always enough money for any of this work, but let alone for coordination within this work, um, but also coordination between the GBV sector and then other humanitarians in the field, um, in other sectors, some of whom until now may not consider GBV and gender equality as humanitarian issues. Um, so how can the GBV sectors better coordinate, both internally and externally? Jagan, over to you first. Thank you, Heva. Um, SGB is everyone's responsibility, as we heard from speakers before. Uh, unfortunately, it happens in all parts of the world, uh, made worse in times of crisis. We also know that no organization or sector can prevent SGB by themselves. That's why coordination and collaboration are, are essential, it is learning from each other. We need a uh, few fundamentals for a better coordination. Uh, number one, having a shared understanding of the issue and the challenges. Number two, having a shared common principles and approaches. For example, do no harm, safety, respect, confidentiality, non-discrimination, right to assistance. I think we need to have that common understanding and having a collective roadmap for action and resourcing for that. And I think as we are launching this collective action today, that's, uh, uh, that's really a testimony to our joint effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jagan. And same question to you, Minister, uh, how to handle the coordination, the constant coordination problem. Thank you, Heba. Uh, let me start by thanking Canada for spearheading this important discussion today. And let me take this opportunity to announce that Denmark will take over the leadership of the Call to Action Initiative as of January 2021. We are very enthusiastic about this. It is a key Danish priority to fight gender-based violence in all settings. The Global Call to Action Initiative provides us with an excellent framework for better coordination and more effective response to gender-based violence. I will point on four key issues here. We need to ensure strong leadership and ownership of the fight against gender-based violence, including strengthening the dialogue with partners. We must systematically advocate for the consideration in the call to action in every relevant international, regional, and local context. We need to secure adequate funding for gender-based violence efforts in all humanitarian uh, action. And we need to continue efforts to build the evidence base for more effective operation on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and congratulations, if that's the right word, on taking this forward, um, or perhaps rather good luck. Um, since you've all succeeded in the, in the first test, you, you now get two and a half minutes to answer uh, the next set of questions. Um, and we're going to try to delve a little bit deeper in this round in, uh, in how, how we get there. So you've kind of all each outlined 
what needs to happen. Um, the funding side, I, I heard the work is not free. Um, the empowerment side, I heard, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there needs to be an intentional letting go and um, the kind of uh, stretching into attacking some of those structural issues that, that David was mentioning in saying that a successful humanitarian organization has to be a feminist organization. So how do we get there? And, and as I mentioned off the top, the goal of the call to action is to drive and foster accountability within the humanitarian sphere. And the ambition is pretty high. Um, so I'm just going to read here off, off of the, um, the roadmap that by 2025, every humanitarian effort from the start includes the policies, systems, and mechanisms necessary to provide safe and comprehensive services to those who are affected by GBV, to prevent GBV, to mitigate GBV risks, especially violence against women and girls. So the reason I say that's ambitious is that, um, as Mark said at the very beginning, you know, the rhetoric has sometimes been stronger than the action. And we've certainly seen that in our reporting. Um, the sector has fallen pretty dramatically short time and again on this front. We interviewed uh, women and girls who had been raped, sexually abused and exploited by peacekeepers in the Central African Republic. And years after their alleged mistreatment by UN peacekeepers, they told us they had felt abandoned, that they hadn't had any justice, that they had no power to complain. Um, and, and last year, when we actually then reported on the investigation into that rape and sexual abuse, um, the whole thing had been bungled by the UN. And there were problems with the DNA samples going rotten, with uh, the victims asked humiliating questions from beginning to end. The, the, through that whole chain that I've just described, the mitigation, the prevention, sorry, mitigation and response, there were failings all the way through. So uh, m my big question, I suppose, is how will this goal that the roadmap lays out be met? And this time I'm going to start with the uh, EU Commissioner Leonard Peach. Thank you. Um, I'll try to answer, uh, although this is only an attempt. Uh, uh, I'll start to, with the current pandemic, which again, proved uh, what we already knew, that uh, crisis exacerbates structural gender inequalities and leads to an increase in GBV. That's why the, it's so important that the call uh, to actions uh, message of ensuring the addressing of GBV is seen as a life-saving uh, and it has to be addressed from the onset of a crisis is so much uh, relevant and important. Uh, since the previous first roadmap, we uh, as call to action partners have already tried to strengthen our work. We have adopted relevant policies and approaches, increased our protection, we increased our gender staffing in the field, we funded many projects that prevent and respond to GBV. We also led the call of, to action uh, ourselves for two years and focused on strengthening the impact at field level. Um, what we are trying to achieve with this new call to action is not simple. Uh, our focus is on a structural change. And looking ahead, I see three key areas for our particular action. First, we must continue our work of implementing the call to action commitment in the field. Our success will only be measured by the real change real change in the lives of survivors of GBV and populations at risk. Secondly, we need to ensure that all of our humanitarian actions are gender sensitive and mitigate GBV risks. We must have proper policies and people in place to ensure that. And lastly, we must strengthen our partnership. I thank Canada for uh, their leadership and for bringing us all together today. As the new roadmap uh, takes uh, effect, it is my hope that we'll continue meeting regularly together in these settings so as to strengthen our partnership, to um, look at each other and to make each other accountable. And I look forward to continuing our collective work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Minister Pran of Denmark. How can this ambitious roadmap be met? The call to action has become a strong coalition of global stakeholders. We are committed to take responsibility. The roadmap will guide us. We need more partnerships with local women's organizations. We need to promote safe and meaningful participation. And we need to promote influence and leadership by women and girls in our humanitarian efforts. We need to focus on gender equality 
and empowerment of women and girls, we will promote girls' access to quality education. We use the potential of education to create gender equal societies. We need emphasis on gender in our analysis and we need more data disaggregated by sex and gender. Only when we know the context, we will be able to do things right. For example, understanding overlapping inequalities, which include those with disabilities, adolescents, girls, and those with diverse sexual orientation and gender identity. We need to increase support to the core work of the UN agencies, NGOs, and their local partners who are dedicated to the ad uh, advancement of women and girls' full enjoyment of human rights. And we need to integrate Nexus consideration, break down silos between development, peace, and humanitarian action. I can assure that Denmark stands ready to perform a strong leadership to fulfill the overall call to action purpose. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was on mute. Next up, we will hear from Minister Sugg of the UK. Thank you. Um, as we've heard, many in the international community have made strong commitments to address GBV in humanitarian crises, but either these services remain chronically underfunded and there's still an unacceptable lack of urgency uh, given to preventing GBV in emergencies. And to see this systemic change we need to protect women and girls in humanitarian contracts, I think requires action in three critical areas. Firstly, as many have said, to strengthen accountability across the humanitarian system. We want to see the rollout of the GBV accountability framework at the country level. And this practical tool really articulates what all humanitarian actors must do to prioritise prevention and response. Uh, we must also ensure accountability for the actions of humanitarian workers, which is why we've signed up to the OECD DAC recommendation on ending sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment in development cooperation and humanitarian assistance. Secondly, we need coordinated, scaled up global action to prevent violence before it starts. And the call to action, I think, is a really powerful platform for this. I'm really pleased that the UK is going to be co-leading the new Generation Equality Action Coalition on GBV. And through our What Works to Prevent Violence programme, we've really seen that violence is preventable, even in conflict affected settings. Um, so we've got robust evidence that this violence is preventable and crucial insights that us how. And we really have a unique opportunity to use this to scale up global action to end violence. And finally, it's really more critical than ever in the context of COVID that we fund comprehensive services that treat survivors with dignity and respect. And you just gave us a great example from what you found. And strengthening this justice for survivors and holding perpetrators to account is really a priority for the UK through our Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative. And we call on all actors to ensure that survivors of violence really have access to the vital services that they need and indeed that saves lives. Um, and I'll just end with it's great to hear from Minister Pren that Denmark will be taking on the leadership of the call to action. Uh, I know uh, that as equality champions, they will continue Canada's strong leadership on this vital issue. Thanks. So I just want to point out that a number of you are donors and a number of you have called on the need for increased funding towards this. So you're more than welcome to share with us your yeah, money where I'm for funding. I agree. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, next for her thoughts on how we can make this vision a reality, uh, Pumzila Lambo Nuka of uh, UN Women. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to just make uh, uh, three uh, quick uh, uh, points. Firstly, the importance uh, of uh, localizing our focus and uh, creating strong local partnerships because these are the partnerships that uh, do not only uh, respond to the immediate, but also are there for the medium to long term. Uh, emergencies sometimes are such that we do not have the time to do these projections, but uh, gender-based violence is there during the crisis, as the crisis increases and has a aftermath. And it's important, therefore, to to create 
a situation where we're not parachuting in and parachuting um, uh, out. And I, must, I also must say, even worse when you have a crisis, uh, strengthening the capacity of local leadership takes some doing. We are seeing now in the work we're doing in Spotlight that uh, you do have to be uh, very focused and patient. Secondly, the issue of funding, which everybody uh, has uh, raised, but I would say it's important that uh, as we are addressing gender-based violence, we should couple that with women's empowerment so that again, we strengthen, we strengthen the women's capacity to fend for themselves. The women tend to stay with offenders because they do not have, uh, they are not empowered enough to be on, on their own. So we always have to inject this empowerment. And then the third point is a building a partnership that enable us to uh, uh, go on large scale. It's obviously a, a critical that uh, we serve as many people as possible in these times, but also that we are able to be accountable uh, as a collective and that we are able to take collective actions that uh, uh, would, uh, would enable us to uh, leave no one behind wherever we can. So partnerships, partnerships and large scale partnerships are critical. Thank you. Partnerships, partnerships, and large-scale partnerships, in case anyone had any doubt. Um, Jagan Chepagain, Sec Secretary General of the IFRC, your thoughts on how this vision can become a reality? Uh, thank you. I would like to share four elements uh, which we believe are crucial and which form our internal compass in how we will address SGBB over the next four years. The first point I would like to second the previous speaker who talked about a localized approach in particular around prevention and response at the local community level in order to ensure approaches are timely, truly reflect local need and realities, and at the core are driven by people in local communities that are directly impacted. Uh, many national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies work in areas and communities where sometimes no official services exist, no other civil society organizations or international actors are present. IFRC is committed to provide technical support to our member societies to implement specialized programs and services for SGBB survivors in line with the global best practice, such as the recently developed interagency GBB in emergency minimum standards uh, through the development of practical toolkits and materials. Number two, uh, expertise. Uh, while SGBB is everyone's responsibilities and we should all address it, however, it is important for all actors involved to invest in technical expertise to build capacities internally and with partners and to lead an evidence generation in this area of work. Red Cross Red Crescent staff and volunteers are often the first responders on situations of crisis. We are deeply committed to support them to strengthen their work on SGBB risk mitigation throughout the emergency program cycle. Number three is shared accountability. Uh, SGBB is everyone's responsibility. All sectors should share the accountability to reduce the risk of SCBB in their respective interventions. We should not leave this to the SCBB actors alone. We can all contribute to make our interventions safer and should be, have, should be held accountable for that. Number four, clear policies and frameworks are in place. Institutional commitments through policies and implementation plans in place are the cornerstones of any long-term and sustainable approach to upwards SGBB for organizations committed to address it. We will particularly commit to strengthen our work to prevent and address sexual exploitation and abuse committed by the staff and volunteers. With this, uh, I'm proud to announce the IFRC's commitment to the new roadmap, particularly to outcomes one, five, and six, and look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you. Over to you, Heather. Thank you. Apologies for taking time to find my mute button and happy to start hearing commitments coming in. Um, so uh, let's consider that the, the bar that everyone now has to meet. Uh, next, Danny Glenwright of uh, Action Against Hunger. Thanks, Heba. So how do we meet the call to action goal? First, I think we need to acknowledge the context that we're in. There are 50 active conflicts happening right now on the planet, more than at any time since the Cold War. Add to that the climate crisis, which is causing new emergencies for us every day. So the best way to meet the goals is to solve these conflicts 
and do something about climate change. As the former UNHCR chief said, there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems, so we need to continue to advocate for political solutions. I also want us to acknowledge and name the often unnamed root causes of GBV, power, privilege, and patriarchy, what I call the three Ps. We know that these are the enemies of women's rights and full equality, and we need to address them. So, while our policymakers are dealing with all of those issues, those of us in the humanitarian space need to look at a couple of things. As my colleagues on the call said, we need to fully take up the localization agenda. We need to walk the talk on partnerships. This can no longer be window dressing, and that's clear to all of us. We know that the change is coming from the local level. Uh, an example for me, when I was touring the, um, the camps after the Rohingya exodus in 2017, at the worst of that crisis, Innovation was being driven by local actors on the ground there and local volunteers. They understood the context. They understood the intersectionalities that were happening there. And those are the type of partnerships we need to embrace right now. We need to look at protection partnerships the same way we look at assistance partnerships. We also need to prioritize gender responsive budgeting and women's economic empowerment as Canada has done. And this week in its throne speech, Canada committed to an intersectional and a feminist COVID-19 recovery. And I encourage others to accept that approach. And as has been noted by you, Heba, let's put some money where our mouths are on this as well. I would recommend government donors, why don't you add 5% to every budget, just as we do for climate change mitigation. We should do the same thing for GBV. We also need more women in leadership if we're ever to realize our humanitarian and our development goals. Finally, we can't let the pandemic set back years of progress. The Gates Foundation recently noted that we've just lost 25 years of work in 25 weeks. That is unacceptable. We know that negative coping mechanisms are on the rise. As has been noted, women and girls are being pushed into sex work. Young girls are being pulled out of school. We have to reverse this trend. If we don't have peace and security for girls and women, let's be frank, we don't have peace and security. So we need to enhance protection, mainstream GBB, and let's please keep our eyes on the big picture. So in short, easy. Thank you. I was just going to say, I mean, the, the answer is basically stopping all the conflicts in the world, stopping climate change, and um, addressing power, privilege, and patriarchy. That sounds simple enough. David, how do you put that vision into practice? Is that to me? Well, I mean, you can share your own thoughts, but I, I think now the challenge has become so big that where are the entry points to really making a difference? Sorry, I didn't know if there was another David on the call. Thanks, thanks a no, lot. No, no, it is you. You're the only David. Um, I, I thought about this in three different areas, really. One is leadership. The second is accountability, which I think is an underestimated and underpowered part of the call to action so far. And the third is transparency. On the leadership front, I find it, we find it helpful to think first of all about following an evidence-led approach. We haven't had much talk of that in respect of programming, but we've learned a lot since the call to action was first launched six or seven years ago about what actually works, both in for helping survivors of GBV, but also in prevention, including in engaging men. And I would like to see a much greater commitment to evidence-led approaches, both to doing the research and then following through on them. I think we could save ourselves a lot of um, reinventing the wheel if we did that. Um, I think that the funding piece is, is important. I'm sorry to be the first to mention the following figure. Our data is that there's 0.21% or 0.12% of humanitarian funding is going into GBV. I mean, that's a total scandal and it's a double scandal given that we know a lot about how to spend it well. And I'd like to see some targets for uh, addressing that from the uh, donors. I think thirdly, the leadership piece is also about how our organizations and our partnerships uh, prioritize this issue. And until it gets the kind of um, focus in response plans that it deserves, uh, then we're not going to go anywhere. I applaud what Mark is trying to do, but it's very disappointing to see the initial uh, global humanitarian response plan from the UN agencies was so disappointing on the range of GBV measures. Uh, secondly, accountability. Um, at one of the first meetings on the call to action, I said we needed a scorecard, a scorecard for donors, a scorecard for UN agencies, and a scorecard for implementers, including like us, on five or six metrics about how we're doing. Funding priority, leadership, partnership, get some proper metrics in place and let's start awarding green, yellow and red cards to different agencies for different performance. 
Because until we have accountability that is simple and comprehensible, we're not going to get the kind of progress that we need. We're not going to have the kind of pressure that we need. I would like that accountability scorecard to set standards, to start set goals, and to commit to biannual, twice a year, progress chasing. For those agencies that are setting the standard, they should get gold stars. And for those that are falling behind, we need to call them out. Uh, but that can't happen just by one agency. We need to have this as a cross, um, cross-sectoral set of scorecards. If we want humanitarian and development actors to work together um, on the ground in crisis settings, which we desperately need, there needs to be a set of accountabilities and scoring mechanisms and metrics that hold them to account. Thirdly, there's no point in having accountability if it's secret. Um, our gender action plan is on our website. The 16 metrics are on the website. You can track the progress that we're making. But that transparency needs to be followed through across the sector. Uh, because without it, we're not, none of us are going to feel the kind of public pressure that's necessary. Thanks very much. You did actually answer my call, which was for some tangible ways into this challenge. Uh, and I think you've listed a number of concrete areas from the scorecard to public reporting, which actually the parliamentary secretary also mentioned right at the beginning um, as ways of, of moving this agenda forward. So thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Rida Anani of Abad, your thoughts on how we can uh, achieve this roadmap in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I couldn't have agreed more with David. Actually, uh, we can definitely say that what has been done thus far is huge and reflective of massive coordinated effort on multiple levels. However, we can surely know much more and do even greater by first, in my opinion, assessing our interventions fearlessly through the lens of the right holders themselves to ensure their engagement, voice, and prioritization of their concerns. Second, ensuring gender sensitive, holistic and intersectional interventions across the humanitarian response to, in, to increase effectiveness and efficiency and sustainable impact. Third, which is very important, building strong mechanisms for follow up and accountability while engaging local stakeholders, particularly women led and women rights CSOs uh, and girl led groups and networks. For fostering safe and people friendly communication of information and reporting mechanisms to ensure it's accessible to all. And this is a great, uh, this is a big challenge when it comes, especially for some countries in the, in the MENA region. Fifth, innovation and innovation and innovation and context adapting uh, for GBV prevention and response activities to sustain effort to stop violence before even it starts by questioning and addressing gender social norms in order to promote the principles of human dignity, gender equality, non-discrimination in a, in, a in a real transformative way. Six, ensure effective ab application of state due diligence principle in practice and really not in literature, meaning designing our programming around fostering real state autonomy and accountability as outcomes rather than dependency and non-cumulative memory of experience, which is the situation in multiple country. And seven, invest in people rather in numbers, not acknowledging people, aspirations, potentials, capacities and priorities will not lead us to a brighter future where they lead on its building. And this is very crucial in work around survivors. What is needed really is an acceleration of action Will and an increase in smart data driven investment. And think GBV is definitely the right thing to do, a smart investment to make, and it is really possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kida. Just add one point to your, your point around um, the reporting, having accessible reporting mechanisms. And one thing we found in this investigation that I mentioned earlier that we will be publishing next week is that actually often you do have reporting mechanisms, but nobody either they don't work or nobody does anything with the results. You know, people report in, they collect the feedback, but then they don't know what to do with it or how to analyze it at scale. So uh, I think a lot of work to be done uh, there too. Uh, final thoughts on this question of how to put the roadmap um, into action. Hilde Mucci from South Sudan. Uh, thank you very much. There is a strong correlation between GBV and culture and also governance. So looking at our programming, you realize that uh, emergency programs are said to be implemented in three months, six months, 
or 12 months maximum. So this type of implementation cannot help us achieve the goal in GBV. I would recommend sequential programming such that emergency programs should be linked to resilience programs and development programs. This will call for partnership such that when you launch an emergency project, then the continuation should be linked to a resilience and a development project. This would, this would mean that what cannot be achieved within an emergency setup can be then handed over to another partner who would continue. This is because social behavior change needs takes a longer time and advocacy takes a longer time. So we are not able to change policy within one month or two months, but then this requires continuity by implementing GBV in terms of result packages that address different components at different times. The other recommendation I would make is about an integrated approach. An integrated approach would mean that for every other project, whether wash, um, food security and livelihood, then it should come with a package that seeks to address gender-based violence and protection to sexual exploitation and abuse. This would expand um, our coverage in terms of GBV and would ensure continuity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilda, and to all of the roundtable speakers for such a range from at a very high level um, power and privilege to at a very concrete level, like reporting mechanisms, um, these thoughts on how to, to move this vision forward. Um, and just again, for those uh, donors on the call, I did hear add 5% to every budget as one, as one potential way forward. Um, we're now going to hear some closing remarks before we then move to statements from the virtual floor. And unfortunately, Henrietta Four was not able to join us today. She had a family emergency. So UNICEF's Deputy Executive Director, Omar Abdi, will be giving the closing remarks. So Omar, over to you. Thank, thank you very much. And as you said, on behalf of Henrietta Four, who despite her strong commitment to this topic, couldn't join us because of family emergency. Our thanks first to Canada for their leadership of the call to action over the last two years, to the Women's Refugee Commission, and to all of the partners whose hard work has helped shape the new roadmap. And congratulations to Denmark on becoming the call to action lead next year. We stand together today, united against gender-based violence everywhere. The launch of the new roadmap provides an important opportunity to build on our work so far and keep moving forward. But as we develop our respective institutional commitments for the call to action, let's be bold, ambitious, and innovative, as several colleagues suggested this morning. Let's ensure all funding for GPV prevention, mitigation, and response at their core. At UNICEF, our commitment to this issue is already reflected in our humanitarian appeals for children. More than 70% of them now include specific appeals to help us end gender-based violence. Next year, 100% of them will. And we are proudly partnering with UNHCR on a blueprint for action to systematically mitigate the risk of GPV for women and children in refugee settings. But we must do more, all of us. In that spirit, UNICEF is proud to announce three specific commitments today to continue strengthening our work in this area. First, we commit to continue, in, to continue integrating GPV across all sectors of our humanitarian response. Our success in education, nutrition, wash, and health also depends on our ability to protect women and children from violence across all of these areas. While we have made a strong start, we will ensure that this issue is reflected across all humanitarian response plans for all the clusters we lead. Second, we commit to partnering with more women's organizations, especially at the local level. We are already working with the organization Voice to link to virtual networks and platforms dedicated to bringing local women's organizations together. We pledge to do much more, especially when so many of these grassroots groups are so often on the front lines of emergency response. And third, we commit to ensuring that our resource allocations clearly reflect our commitment to ending GPV in emergencies. 
every response plan should show proportionate funding to GPV. If a response is 90% funded, the budget for addressing GPV should be 90% funded too. We call on all our partners to join us in making this commitment. We thank, of course, all of the donors who have shown so much leadership on this issue. None of these commitments nor our responses would have been possible without your continued generosity and vision. We hope other donors who are not yet funding GPV programming will consider joining the strong coalition represented here today. Let's use this extraordinary moment to accelerate our work and bring about the change we need to see. Millions of girls and women are counting on us. We must not let them down. Thank you, Sukran. Shukran, Nick. Thank you, Omar. We will now hear uh, statements from the floor with further insight on how the sector can collectively address GBV, but also hopefully some commitments from call to action partners, um, as well as some voices from the field who bring us uh, those local and, and gendered perspectives that um, we have heard over the last hour are so important in finding the solution to this problem. So I would first like to call upon Angeles Moreno, Spain's Vice Minister for International Cooperation. Thank you, Heba. First of all, I would like to thank Canada for uh, its work during these two years as the leader of the Call to Action Initiative. And of course, those who preceded uh, it, uh, the United States and DG ECO. Spain is firmly committed to the fight against gender-based violence, both internally and in our external action. We have supported initiatives such as Security Council Resolution 2242, and we have recently participated in the drafting process of the resolution on COVID on women and girls yet to be tabled. During the recent Spanish presidency of the Ocha Donors Group, Spain has positioned gender uh, equality and the empowerment of women and girls on top of the agenda. Gender equality is necessary if we are to eliminate gender-based violence. Uh, in our humanitarian action strategy 2019-2026, we have strengthened the gender approach in all humanitarian interventions. One of the plan's uh, main lines of action uh, aims at taking action against gender-based violence. We are putting it in practice in humanitarian contexts such as Palestine, Syria, South Sudan, Lebanon, uh, Niger and Mozambique. We also support the ICRC's uh, special appeal against sexual violence. Finally, uh, we need to strengthen capacities in this field. That is why we have put uh, together a training package for Spanish humanitarian actors that focuses on gender, particularly prevention and response to gender-based violence in humanitarian action. We have also included specific training on gender and health for the staff on the Spanish technical, uh, of the Spanish technical uh, aid response team, as we are very concerned about the impact that the pandemic is having on women and girls at all levels, but particularly on the incidence of gender-based violence as uh, the SG and uh, Antonio Guterres uh, warned in April. We need to do more to include gender equality together with prevention and response to gender-based violence in all humanitarian response plans. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Vice Minister. And next we will hear from Marianne Hagen, the State Secretary of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first start by thanking the excellent panelists and of course the Call to Action Network for your tremendous efforts to fight gender-based violence in emergencies. We know we can achieve better results when we are working together. From October 1st, Norway will be co-chairing the Call to Action State and Donors Working Group together with the UK. One in three women will suffer physical or sexual abuse in her lifetime. This makes SGBV a global challenge that must be addressed in all communities at all times. Addressing sexual and gender-based violence needs to be given a high priority. This is not the standalone issue. Protecting those at risk and assisting survivors of SGBV must be front and center in both our humanitarian response and our longer term efforts to promote peace and development. Norway will continue to keep SGBV 
very high on the agenda event to the Oslo conference last year. It will take place at 10 o'clock East, Eastern Standard Time on Monday. Hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you very much, State Secretary. And next we will hear from Dia Minatu, who is a member of the National Children's Parliament of Mali and president of the Children's Parliament of the Bamako District. And because she is only 17, we are not disclosing her last name for protection reasons. Dia Minatu. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Je remercie le gouvernement. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I would like to thank the government of Canada and the organizers for the, or the uh, holding of this event. I am a member of the Children's Parliament, an ardent defender of the cause of children and of girls in particular. The question of GBV is a reality in Mali. We've had many incidents of gender-based violence. 45% of the survivors of this kind of violence are under the age of 18. The last report by Ocha on Mali uh, said that the uh, rights of uh, girls and women has seriously uh, uh, been degraded uh, over the last few years, in part because of the armed conflict in the country. The situation has become even more serious since the appearance on the scene of COVID-19. The legal and juridical reality in the country does not sufficiently protect girls and women. They are also disproportionately affected by the uh, armed conflict. So uh, uh, in the name of all children in the world, in particular uh, girls, I exhort and, and uh, ask all leaders to do whatever necessary to protect girls and women from the ravages of VBG. Thank you, of GBV. Thank you very much. And can I just say how um, unusual, frankly, it is to have people like you um, right next to ministers of European countries. And I think that's a pretty big step forward in that vision of including the voices of people who, affected, who are affected by the issues um, that policymakers are dealing with in, in these discussions. Uh, next up, we will turn to Yanti Siripto, the president and CEO of Save the Children US. Thanks, Heba. And thank you, Diaminitu. It's fantastic to work with partners like yourself. Um, so money and visibility, and visibility needs to lead to accountability. A lot of people have talked about the grossly and shockingly underfundedness of, of GBV. Appeals are not asking for it and appeals that are asking for it are not met. So that's bad on both the, the, the NGOs and UN agencies in the sector as well as on the donors. Secondly, the needs of adolescents, girls in particular, need to continue to be invisible in our assessments and in our response plans. So what we would want to commit to and urge our partners to commit to, to increase increase the funding, particularly for girl-led groups on the front line, and Save the Children also needs to do better in reporting on it and be accountable to making sure that that happens. And we haven't done that to date as much as I would like. Support safe and meaningful participation, like we've just seen, of adolescents, girls in the design and implementation of our responses. And lastly, tailored violence interventions for adolescent girl needs in particular, making sure there are mental health and psychosocial support and sexual reproductive health services, as well as girl-friendly safe spaces. And lastly, data need to be disaggregated by sex, age, and disability to make sure that we're measuring and holding ourselves accountable for progress against these actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanti. Uh, I'm sorry to do this to you, Ambassador, um, but you have heard now many calls from people for more funding and more funding specifically to uh, women-led, refugee-led local organizations. So next up, Ambassador Zibel Zorg, Director General for Crisis Prevention, Stabilization, Post-Conflict post -conflict Peacebuilding and Humanitarian Assistance at the German Federal Foreign Office. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all these calls for funding and from a donor's perspective, whether there's any room to move. Thank on. you, first of all, Heba, and thank you for making this such a focused and lively discussion. This is really very, very helpful. Um, before I answer your question, I, I would like to make uh, to echo a few points. Two, 2020 
a year marked by COVID uh, confirmed that emergencies and crises increase the risk of gender-based violence. And we witnessed a substantial increase of cases of GBV. And yet our means and methods to address it remain very limited. Um, I'd like to thank Canada and all partners for the excellent new roadmap. And I'm honored to renew our commitments. In 2019, we pledged over 80 million euros to humanitarian projects with substantial GBV components. And we helped to fund the ICRC special appeal, strengthening the response to sexual violence. And we will continue using gender specific data and requirements in all our funding decisions. That's very important to us. And we will continue to allocate dedicated funding for GBV prevention and mitigation, including through our partnership with UN Women and UNFPA. And we will continue to use our political weight to fight GBV. And I will uh, tell you as well, because you asked uh, for the funding specifically, we are fighting very hard to keep up our record, not, uh, our record uh, means for humanitarian aid, including GBV, which we could allocate this year, which was in total 2.5 billion US dollars and uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, positive that our federal parliament is on our side on this. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for uh, allowing me to put you on the spot like that. And I, I, uh, I am sure that the um, battle for maintaining funding is very real in the age of uh, a recession and the financial impacts of COVID. So um, certainly, if this was difficult to fund before, it may well become even more difficult to fund moving forward unless um, there is, as you say, a lot of internal pushing. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Gillian Triggs, UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Protection. Gillian, I'm afraid you're on mute. very much. On behalf of the of the UN Refugee Agency, can I, of course, support the call to action um, and 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 the idea of the of the roadmap. Uh, and we hope very much to contribute to it. What I'd like to do is to make two points. Uh, and the first is a question. Why, you might ask, would I single out refugees? Well, the answer is that we have something in the order of 80 million people displaced within their own countries or across national boundaries. And they are usually among the most vulnerable people globally who depend on the informal economy. With COVID lockdowns, family tensions, evictions from home, loss of jobs, school closures, we've seen almost immediate spikes in reports of gender-based violence, exposing vulnerable refugees and asylum seekers, women, children, men and boys to unprecedented levels of abuse, trafficking, child marriages and sexual exploitation. And that is why the Global Compact for Refugees is so important in raising the issue of global responsibility. Well, of course, rhetoric does tend to be ahead of action. And my second question is, what's UNHCR doing about it? Well, we're providing cash assistance to many countries, hotlines in Ecuador, using WhatsApp information lines for Mexico, safe shelters in Colombia, remote referrals to psychosocial support in Cameroon, and radio messages in Kenya to build confidence in GBV services. But our uh, answer to the call for action is yes, we want to scale up all of these activities so that we're better prepared uh, for the future. But above all, we do want to be prepared for uh, what were likely to be more emergencies for growing numbers of people, displaced, stateless uh, asylum seekers. Uh, the emergencies could be of all kinds. It might be another pandemic though, God forbid, uh, but it will be a a caused by environmental degradation, um, climate change, continued conflicts, poverty, inequality, all of the issues that you're all very well aware of. So in concluding, uh, can I paraphrase Canada's uh, slogan, let us be bold, be visionary and be prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gillian. And uh, the more every speaker says a few more words, I think, oh my goodness, the challenge is just so large given uh, this particular moment that we're facing when it comes to the funding environment dropping just as the needs are about to uh, skyrocket. And so it's very easy to see how GBV can then get lost in, in that um, without the kind of 
uh, leadership and, and dedication that you've just described. I'm next going to turn to uh, Dara McLeod, War Child Canada's Executive Director. Thank you. So when the pandemic broke out, we at War Child Canada recognized the threat it posed to gains made in women's safety and security. And that's why we conducted a remote assessment across eight provinces in Afghanistan to examine the gender-based violent trends under these COVID-19 restrictions. Now of the respondents that we sampled, 35% reported an increase in GBV due to the pandemic. And of particular concern, 75% reported that services for women had been closed because of the pandemic. So the remote monitoring and management of gender-based violence programming has become even more critical in the context of COVID-19. That's why War Child Canada has developed a step-by-step -step toolkit for the monitoring and evaluation of GBV programming in restricted environments. And this toolkit provides an overview of key methods, tools, and the best practices for establishing a remote management structure for the monitoring and evaluation of GBV um, prevention and response. So as part of our commitment to the call to action, we look forward to sharing this toolkit with our INGO partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dara. Next uh, statement from the floor will come from Claudine Songo, the Executive Director of Dynamique des Femmes Juristes, which is a women's organization in DRC that helps women access justice and fight against impunity. So uh, very relevant given the examples I shared earlier. Claudine. Okay, thank you very much for that opportunity. In the DRC, many areas in the eastern part are still now in conflict. Thousands of women and girls are displaced from their home. They are raped and killed. They are sexually abused for food and humanitarian aid, but they are not involved in humanitarian interventions and decision-making process. With this launch of the new global call to action roadmap, it is a new and great opportunity for DFJ and CARE, our partner, to renew our commitment to contribute to realizing its vision in DRC. DRG is pleased to be part of the DRC on Call to Action National Roadmap, despite many challenges. With care support, we will strengthen the network and coalition of women's group and women-led organization. We will support them to access funds and to influence decision and together, we will join our efforts, capacities, resources, and action to make this call to action roadmap a success. Core to our work, we will ensure that we elevate women and girls' voices, that we showcase their work on the front line and put them at the center of creating change in their community. Gender equality cannot be a dream, but a reality. And women and girls in DRC deserve a life free from GBV. Though I strongly believe that together we are strong and we will bring for change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from Ambassador Ruth Huber, the Deputy Director of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Thank you, Heba. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Canada for the leadership in the preparation of the new roadmap. We reiterate our firm commitment to the principles and objectives of the call to action. Gender inequality and patriarchal norms are at the root of gender-based violence. We will make concerted efforts to support women's rights and women's organizations and to strengthen gender equality in humanitarian action. Women must play a leading role in matters that affect their lives and the fate of their communities. Strengthening locally owned systems, including government agencies at all levels, require longer term commitments. Switzerland will engage in prevention and response to GBV beyond emergencies. Actually, we managed to double our funds to GBV last year and will further uh, increase our funding, our multi-year funding. The fight for gender equality and against GBV requires everybody's contribution. And Switzerland commits to remaining a strong partner in this collective endeavor. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ambassador, and apologies once again, my uh, computer's playing games with me. Next, we're going to hear from Anne Birgit Albrechtsten, and she will forgive me for having mispronounced her name, surely, um, CEO of Plan International. You did it brilliantly, Heba. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by thanking just all the speakers for an inspiring and energizing afternoon for me here in um, in London. One of the best, actually, um, during lockdown, especially given how many speakers there have been. But so let me just quickly mention that, of course, we know that ma the majority of those that are affected by humanitarian crisis of children and girls. Children are particularly vulnerable to sexual and gender based violence, trafficking and recruitment into armed groups and often all at the same time. And girls, we know, are disproportionately affected. Um, but as so many of you have said, the protection needs of child survivors and the unique needs of girls are still often rendered invisible. So this has to change and the call to action will surely do that. And during this uh, roadmap period, Plan International is re renewing and stepping up our own commitment to be a full and active partner of the call to action. Um, our commitments will apply across our development and humanitarian activities. Many of you have talked about the nexus and needing to do it in both areas and in all crisis settings where we work. Specifically, we are committed to stronger advocacy and holding everybody to account for ending sexual gender-based violence, doggedly pushing for feminization of the humanitarian sector and of donor policies and priorities. Um, implementing specialized gender-based violence, including sexual and reproductive health services and protection programs for child survivors, especially girls, in all their diversity. And finally, being as demanding on ourselves as we are on others, promoting gender equality and feminist leadership throughout our organization, giving up power to girl-led local partners and making all our programs truly gender transformative. We know that we will only succeed and make real process when we rid the aid sector of sexism and racism. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, putting this in the context of what I think is a, is a very um, overpowering and necessary look at that wider context in which um, aid takes place and some of the those wider transformations that certainly we at the New Humanitarian have been um, trying to bring into the conversation. I'm next going to turn to Eric de Meyer, Director of the Humanitarian Aid and Transition Directorate at Belgium's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes, on behalf of Belgium, I would like to thank the Government of Canada and the co-sponsors for organizing this event. I would also like to congratulate all partners on the update of the roadmap that is being launched today for their important work in order to respond to and prevent gender-based violence. Belgium is today reaffirming its commitments to transform the way in which gender-based violence is addressed in humanitarian settings by ensuring that proper attention is given to this issue in the future of our humanitarian programming. Firstly, we will integrate the prevention of and response to GBV in the ongoing update of our Belgian humanitarian aid strategy. Secondly, we will increase our annual, contr annual contribution to specific GBV projects. Finally, we will address this topic with our strategic humanitarian partners in order to ensure continuous attention to and accountability for GBV in humanitarian settings. I thank you for your attention and look forward to working with all call to action partners in making sure that nobody will fall victim to these practices. Thank you. Are you going to leave us in suspense about how much you're increasing the annual contribution? Of course. <laughs> Next uh, on our statements from the floor is Gloria Soma, Executive Director of Titi Foundation, which is a local NGO in Juba, South Sudan, that creates safe environments for women and children. Well, thank you so much. A good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Government of Canada for shining a light on gender-based violence. We have witnessed a rise in gender-based violence in South Sudan as a result of the protracted crisis and COVID-19. Notably is the increase in rape cases and the high numbers in child pregnancies. In Eastern Equatoria alone, we have about 125 young girls that are pregnant at the moment. 
and that has been documented. We've also seen an increase in vulnerability of women. Up to 91% of women households have fewer assets or sources of livelihoods. And that's a report that has just been published by the University of Juba. In South Sudan, the local women-led organizations have been able to contribute in the fight against GBV by providing case management services, access to justice, developing helplines, which have assisted survivors to access psychosocial support, and also to report GBV cases in a timely manner. They've also been able to train in the, in the budge to support women empowerment programs by training local women in the production of reusable sanitary towels, face masks, and soaps. Therefore, in our commitment to advance localization, we request for quality, quick, and long-term funding that need to be put in place, especially in support of frontline local women-led organizations and partners who are already taking lead in the fight against gender-based violence to ensure that survivors have access to a comprehensive, quality, safe, and dignified GBV services. In South Sudan, Canada and other donor governments as friends to the South Sudan peace process should encourage the government to the revitalized peace agreement to silence the guns and stop the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. They should encourage the government of South Sudan to commit to the outlined objectives of the RCs, especially on ensuring women's participation in the transitional government and other governance structures as an important step towards peace and justice, and also to fast track the establishment of the transitional justice systems in the country. Moving forward, this moment should be a stepping stone towards a more systematic inclusion of women's organizations in the call to action discussions and other forums at global and country level. Local women voices and perspectives must be given a central role in all conversations between donors, UN and humanitarian agencies. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gloria, for that strong call from the uh, ground level realities that you're facing. Our second to last statement from the floor is from Rumbi Matewe, who is the acting country director in Zimbabwe for the Mary Stopes International. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Rumbi Mate, Programs Director and Acting Country Director with Mary Stops International in Zimbabwe. About 45% of women in my country report that their first sexual encounter was not consensual. Survivors need access to agents, tailored and compassionate SRIHR care, including emergency contraception, pregnancy testing, abortion care, STI and HIV testing, and treatment of injuries. Partnership is crucial, and to strengthen our referral networks, we are collaborating with a dynamic young woman organization called Cuts with Sisterhood. Today, we recommit to the call to action and to working in partnership with others to scale up access to survivors and to advocate to remove unnecessary policy and legal restrictions, which restrict timely access to services for survivors. Thank you. I must say that statistic is shocking. 45% of women say their first sexual encounter is not consensual. I mean, that just blows me away and puts into context everything we've been talking about today. Uh, our last statement from the floor will come to us by video from Sarah Costa, the Executive Director of the Women's Refugee Commission, which has been helping Canada develop this roadmap. Good morning. I'm Sarah Acosta, Executive Director of the Women's Refugee Commission. This is a moment of inspiration and of reckoning. The continued commitment to ending gender-based violence. The pledge to hold ourselves accountable for action. This remains deeply inspiring. We must also face the reality that so much remains to be done. WRC welcomes the focused attention to the links between gender inequality and gender-based violence. The emphasis on localization is essential. WRC will expand partnerships with local women's organizations, including women-led organizations of persons with disabilities. 
in displaced and host communities. We urge everyone to answer Ms. Vuni's call to join forces with youth. They will transform attitudes and action in their communities. Thank you all, and thanks to the Government of Canada for its strong leadership. Wonderful. So that uh, you've made it through all of those speakers. I didn't think we would do it, but we have. I'm going to try to summarize some of the commitments I heard as a way of perhaps um, showing what's possible and where others might be able to um, join in. I heard um, commitments to make GBV programming a condition of funding. I heard commitments from governments to fight internally to be able to maintain funding for GBV and for humanitarian uh, programming more broadly. I heard um, commitments to integrate the GBV focus into government strategy. I heard NGOs committing to being um, more transparent, both about how their, uh, the funding they do receive is distributed and also about how they hold themselves accountable. I heard uh, many commitments to work more closely with um, local and women-led NGOs on the ground, uh, commitments to better collect uh, desegregated data, and perhaps most um, interestingly for me, a real recognition that the the root cause of of these um, of GBV is is uh, is a much wider structure that needs to be unpacked, and that humanitarians have a role to play in doing that. Um, so thank you very much. That brings us to the close of um, the launch of this roadmap. If you'd like any more information about the call to action or you want to read that roadmap in detail, um, you can visit calltoactiongbv.com and I think someone will throw a link into the Zoom chat. And if any of you on the call today are not already partners of the call to action and are interested in joining it, information on how to join is available on the website. You can also reach out to Canada to learn more. So um, I can now wish you a happy weekend. This uh, is Heba Ali of the New Humanitarian and good luck as you take this forward. Bye everyone.